Thanks everybody again for being here and thank you for sharing those prayer requests this morning. I got in here this morning and discovered I'm feeling a little bit wobbly this morning. <laughs> Don't know why, all the legs are still on down there, but. Alright. I wasn't here last week. Thanks to Dan for filling in for me last week. And there will be 20 extra credit points for anybody that can tell me what the lesson was about last week. Somebody besides Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> Can you, can you narrow that down a little bit? Second Peter. <laughs> False teachings. False teachings. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was kind of good in light of what Dan was talking about. Christians oh, coming okay. into the prison ministry, you know, causing problems. And, and the issue with false teachings. Uh, last week that I was here, we talked about a little bit starting into the uh, false teachings too and one of the things I pointed out was the secret service was in part created to help detect false currency and I said that I wish I had brought in a little prop that I had pass this around look at it and see what you can see what's wrong with it uh, don't make any out loud observations so your your neighbor will figure out what's wrong with it before it even gets to them it's pretty hard to see what, what's wrong with it. Okay, so we're going to continue. Well, it's a little bit of a carryover from the false teachings. Peter's concerned about that. Just as a review, who is this letter written to? Just the Pestle, first and second Peter. They're both written to the same group of people. Christians. Christians. New believers. Christians, people that were being persecuted because of their beliefs. But, but in 2 Peter, he goes on to not emphasize the persecutions, the sufferings that they're going through, but also that there, that there's false teachers out there. That's an, there's, that Satan's looking to get a grip on them, knowing that they're suffering, they're probably uh, failing in their, in their belief a little bit. Uh, why are we going through the suffering? And on top of that, these false teachings are coming in too. So today, most of the lesson is about where do we get the truth from? Uh, and I'm sure that when Dan's there, he's sharing the truth, and I know where he gets that from, but there are other people, many other people. It's, it's a shame that people are, are proclaiming to spread the word of Christ, and it's, it's, it's false teachings. So that's where we're going today. At the end, I'll, I'll ask about that coin and what you can see what's wrong with it. Lesson 10, we're winding down doctrine of sure scriptures. How do we know that the scriptures are sure? We believe that God's word. God inspired. Sometimes, well, all, all the time, men actually did the physical penning of the word, but those were God-inspired words. Today we'll be in 2 Peter 1, 12 through 21, and a little bit in Peter 2, but mostly those verses right there. So again, uh, as usual, I will ask somebody to help uh, read the verses today. Not too awful many. The big idea, your first underlines on your sheet, there's always a big idea. The scriptures is our soul final authority for all manner of faith and practices. Everything we do, our faith, everything we do because of our faith, it should be grounded in, in the final authority of, of Scripture, God's Word. By the way, uh, those epistles, 1st and 2nd Peter, were to those, those people that we mentioned. Is there any other group of people that that this is meant for? All of us. All of us. It's included in God's Word because He had an intended purpose for us in here. And, and we can see, even though there was differences of time and culture and many other things, as, as some of the folks in this class have been taking that uh, journey into God's Word, that there is a difference between 
their time and our time, but there's there's a bridge that spans those times. It, it, it's a commonality, the things that God intended for them to have and God intended for us to have. And it ends there for a reason. Question, what guides choices you make on a daily basis? Is it something you think about or is it, does it just happen? Comments on that? Important things are especially is the ones we do back to the Word of God. So you Minor say, things, not necessarily. So you just act on those and you don't really spend a lot of time thinking some, about yeah, it. But for the yeah. big ones, you, you spend some time thinking about it and then possibly looking for guidance from God on, on what to do about it. That's how I handle it too. And sometimes you know, the things that maybe you think about don't mean so much turn out to be something a little bit bigger and you wish you would have yeah. thought about it a little bit more. <laughs> Written word is foundational. God's scripture, God's word is the foundation that we should, the things that we need to think about, the things that we need God's help on, that we go to scripture, the written word. It's the foundation for our belief. Um, someone want to read verse 12? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. Check Second Peter, I'm sorry. Second Peter, chapter one, verse twelve. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them, and are firmly established in the truth you now have. What do you suppose that truth is? Where's that truth come from? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That's word. Thank you. By the way, uh, as we talked about earlier, Peter's an aged man at this point. He's probably somewhere around 70 years old. Uh, <laughs> well, there again, you got to think about their time in our time. Okay. You know where we stand with him, right? <laughs> Respect your elders. Okay. Maybe I should rephrase it. <laughs> He's a, yeah, mature. He's a senior citizen. He's an aging man. Peter's reminder for this reason. What's important about that? Peter says for this reason. It, it's because... Something's been happening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Their salvation begins with Scripture. You need to always refer back to that scripture. We're talking about truth here and where we get that truth from. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing. And I see it's not all fitting on there. And hearing by the word of God. So that we know, know where our faith comes. And it comes from, we're firmly grounded. That's our foundation is in the word of God. Am I in your way, Pam? No, no, no. all right. 2 Timothy 3.15, and that, that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Can you imagine that? Well, that's what we have children Sunday school for. Amen. And, and that, that is a foundation for us, too, that we bring those kids up early and often, and then it's so important to see those kids back there. We, we know they're back there right now in, in, in other places, children Sunday school, that we teach them early, we teach them often. That from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise from salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. I think that's one of the things that stand out in vacation Bible school that kind of surprised us a little bit. We just assumed this, that the kids, kids, most kids have some kind of, maybe once upon a time, but not so much these days, they have a little bit of foundation in who Christ is, but when you go... You have a group of kids that don't know the, uh, the words that Jesus loves me. I mean, it's kind of eye opening. They're just not getting that today. Foundational continued. All right, take a little bit of time, 2 Peter 1 through 12, and, and find the amount of times that it refers to knowledge or knowing. Know or knowing is mentioned. And in that context, that word, what, what, is, what is that always? What do you need to know? What, what is your knowledge based on? 
Uh, just take a couple minutes. It won't really take too long to read 1 through 12. like uh, several of you are done. Anybody that, that got all, all the way through that? Anybody? How many times did you find that, that knowledge or, or no or knowing was used? One through twelve. Got four. Four? I got six. Seven. Seven. I think I had seven counting the word no. I forget what verse that was in, but Knowledge was used over and over again, but no means the same thing that you know instead of knowledge. What's the context of what are what do we need to know? What what's Peter's emphasis in on, on knowledge? On God. On God. Things of God. Jesus Christ. The will of God. The will of God. Very good. How do we get to know God? If Peter emphasizes how important it is that we know God, that we know Jesus, the will of God, being holy like God, how is it that we, those people, I'll get into that a little bit, but Peter's talking to them that they know that, that they have that knowledge. This is somebody 2,000 years ago that, that Peter said that they could know, but how do we know today? How do we know what that, that knowledge is? By reading, By reading the scriptures, God's word. It's intended for us as it was intended for them thousands of years ago. And, and not only that, but the, the purpose of this lesson is that we know that through the word, but we, we can know God in prayer, that personal intimate relationship you have in your prayer life, and also what the Holy Spirit reveals too. But for the purpose of this, it, it's in the word of God. God makes himself known through the Bible. All of this is here for, for us to glean that information from. And then Peter points out too that, it's, that he's, he's given us a reminder. He's coming back again at us uh, to, to let us know that these things are important. Now, has anyone ever heard the expression, if you hear a lie often enough, you'll soon start to believe it? Do you think that applies for God's word too? Mm -hmm. If you hear God's word often enough to believe it, it becomes ingrained in the decisions that you make. You're, you're very believed. So that stresses the importance of it. There's other people out there and other, other influences that, that are hitting you time and time again, trying to get you to believe those fables, if you will. But if you spend your time believing God's word, knowing that this is where the truth is at over and over again, that the, the other the other sources will be overpowered. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing. Hearing, yeah. absolutely. Hearing over and over again. So spend your time in God's Word. You might have read it who knows how many times, you know, during, I mean, even particular passages, passages and, and perhaps it's something that you've never, it never really kicked in before. You've read, you know you've read it many times, and all of a sudden, God has something for you out of that passage in that particular way. The written word is sufficient. What do you think that means? 
So I mean, it, it, it's it's here to meet your needs. You don't need any. You don't need to go to other sources. And First Peter one three says, as his, his divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. All things that pertain to life, He's given to us all things. It is sufficient for what we need through the knowledge of Him. There again, that knowledge comes from the Word of God. And we're called, called to be glorious and, and have virtue through that too. Through the knowledge of Him, that equals the Bible. Where do we get that knowledge? Where do we get that truth from? Don't throw it. <laughs> might get it in the back of the Is it in the back of the head? It in the <laughs> oh! Again, sufficient. It is sufficient for us. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for construction of instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped. Thoroughly equipped means it's sufficient. You have everything you need of every good word. The written word is divine. What does that mean? God inspired. God's inspired, exactly. It comes from God. It's the truth. You can count on it. Its delivery is not by man, is not man's doing. It is here. Man did the actual physical penning of it. Except for the kind of commandments that God actually wrote that one. Uh, the rest of it, it took a man to actually write it down that these were inspired words. Verse 16. Let's read 16 through 21. Would someone do that, please? Well, before we do, uh, there is something important. This wasn't actually part of the curriculum today, but I, I thought it uh, needs to be addressed. In 13, Peter says, Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. What does in this tent mean? Still alive. Still alive. Uh, and then Peter says, I need to stir you up by reminding you. I have to hit you again. You know, you, you may know this already, but I have to keep coming at you because there are other false prophets and teachers out there trying to do the same thing. I have to remind you. Knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Anybody remember what that means? Peter, or Peter spoke of his death. Spoke of his death. He did. Uh, I think it was in, in John towards the end that Jesus told Peter that he would die for his faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. So he, Peter refers to the fact that Jesus told him that Putting off this tent means that he realizes that his, his time is growing short. Wherever I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So, here it is. Here's the proof. This this letter, after Peter's long gone, that, that we have that reminder of those things that, that, was, that was on Peter's heart at that time. Uh, struggling, struggling with physical afflictions, uh, persecution, struggle, struggling with false teachers, that, that Peter, that those were heavy, I mean, here's Peter at the end of his life, knowing that his days are numbered, probably in a prison by this point, that he wants to address this, and he wants to leave it as a living reminder, too, for not just those people then, but for us today. All right, so someone want to read 16 through 21, please? For we did, for we did not follow any of the body's when we came here to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were our witnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, and such a voice came to him from the excellent Lord. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have a prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place 
until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing this first that no prophecy of Scripture is of any part of interpretation. The prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you very much. Its delivery is not is not by man's doing. And we talk about that. It, it, is, it is divine. It comes from God. The God, these are God inspired, God breathed words <coughs> that man put down on paper, but they're there for a reason. They're there for a reason. Two thousand and some years later. Uh, not following cunningly devised fables. I, I had to emphasize that word fables there because I wanted to ask the question, what is a fable? What does a fable mean to you? In context of, what do you think Peter meant about fables? Tales. Tales. stories, lies. False. False. Here again is a group of people out there making this sound like the truth. You know, and, and you know, when we think about fables, we think about a story that has its roots in the truth. You know, some of Aesop's fables, you know, they tell stories that, that had, a, had a meaning, a deeper meaning. But in this context, these fables, well, they're, they're, they're the same thing. There's somebody coming under cover that th this is God's inspired word, and in fact, it wasn't. It was a fable, and, and Peter is one who used it. And that's not the only time that word fables is used. These, these false teachers are coming to you with this information that this is the truth. Beware of this, folks. Second, First Timothy 1, 3 through 4, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, re remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Don't give heed to fables. Timothy used that, that expression too. And endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. So here's a group of people that, that, that Timothy's want to address too. That, that there are people out there spreading fables, spreading false truth, and it's causing problems, which causes disputes. And it goes on today too. People out there with, with, with a false message, spreading their word, and, and if you know the truth, you can argue that point. If you don't know the truth, if you're not firmly grounded, what protects you from those those fables, those things that people come to you with that, that sound so good, they sound so real, and yet there's just <coughs> like the sacred service. Look for the difference, it's called look for the similarities. This delivery is not by man's doing, uh, in verse 16, not following kind of cunningly re revised, revised fables. First Corinthians 2, anybody got comments or questions? One thing, uh, one thing I'd like to point out, there were scriptures available at this time of Peter's, you know, the, the, the Old Testament was available. <laughs> and by the time this letter was written, uh, scholars think it was in, in uh, 64 to 67 AD. And the first, Matthew, Mark, and John, scholars also believe that those those first documented cases of the gospel were already starting to circulate too in the early 60s, early 60 ADs. So that was starting, and it was in Aramaic. It hadn't been translated to Greek or anything at that point. But it was out there. The gospels, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, why didn't I mention John? Why? John, John lived the longest. Yeah, he lived to be. I'm not going to say an old man. <laughs> he lived to be about 90. And he, did, he was a martyr. He was exiled on the uh, island of the Isle of Patmos. And I think God had a purpose in letting him live that long. Not to be an old man, a young man. But anyhow, he wanted to reveal what heaven looked like and revelations and all of that stuff. But anyhow, there, 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 were, there were ways when Peter's talking about people to, to, to find the truth. There were ways to do that. Uh, as I said, the Old Testament had been around for, for hundreds of years at this point, and, and also the, the Gospels were starting to circulate too by this time. 1 Corinthians 1 18, for the message of 
For us as foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who, who are being saved, it is the power of God. And that is reference to people that are perishing. They're never going to get it. I mean, you can sit them down and read, read the Bible, and they're not going to believe it, first of all, and they just don't understand it, you know, because they don't have it. They've already got their minds made up. Now, I have heard of some people that, that really, uh, Lee, Lee Strobel was, was an atheist, you know, and, and he started doing it. He tried to be objective as a, as a journalist and started talking to, to knowledgeable people and, and actually was convinced it's easier to believe God's word than to dispute it. Because he, he tried to be as objective as he could. This delivery is not by man's doing. Uh, prophecy never came from the will of man. It's always God inspired. Now, did I go too fast on that? Is everybody getting the blanks? I think this divine one had uh, A, B, and C, if I'm not mistaken. B, its truth is not man's by man's experience. Now we can, uh, man can experience a lot in his lifetime that would confirm God's truth, things that we've been through, to know that, yes, it is true what God says. We have the prophetic word confirmed, and that was from verse 19. Truth confirms experience. And that's the way that was written, but I looked at that, and I would, I think I would rather flip that myself. Experience confirms the truth, not the truth. Anybody got any thoughts on that? I think that the what, things that we go through in our life, that we oh, okay. things that we that we go through in our life confirms what we we know that God says the truth. Sometimes people put their Police and, and, and have experience, and it's not really God at all. And then they will assume that's truth, and it's not. Yeah. You, know, you can. Yeah. That's you can back into the wrong truth. Let's put that. So in the end, you have to get back to God's word to, to really know what the truth is. Eyewitnesses of His Majesty. <coughs> Peter refers to that. Peter was there. He was there for the Transfiguration. He, he, Peter, James, and John were there for that and saw that. Peter makes references in, into those verses that were just read that he was there. He, he touched Christ. He, he heard Christ's word. Christ's word. Uh, he was there for the for the uh, ascension too. Peter wanted people to know that I was there. I witnessed these things happen, and, and I believe them. I believe. I know what the truth is. Heard his voice, which came from heaven, talking about God, uh, God in his reverence to, uh, this is my beloved son. And, and that's where the experience comes through. That, and I think that most of us, as we, I'm afraid to use that word over now, because I get in trouble. As we mature, that we have more life experiences behind us. That we, that, that we can look back and tell other people, younger folks that are struggling with things that they're going through, that I've been through this, I've, I've got that experience behind me. I know, I know what God says is true because I, I've seen it happen. I've lived it. And that's what Peter was saying, that I was there. Its truth is not by man's experience, uh, continued John 1, 1 through 3, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and this is coming from John, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. And that's, that's a reference going back to, to, to Christ. Continuing on with the divine, its truth is not my man's experience. The light was manifested as we have seen in I'm struggling with some of these. Bear witness. Bear, bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested to us. Thank you. That we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. 
And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. That, that if you have that truth and you've lived that experience, that you can share that fellowship too with, with, with your Son, Jesus Christ. This meeting is not, is, is not by man's, see, we're getting close here, is not by man's ideas. Man didn't think this word up, man, these aren't man's truth, these are Jesus, the, the word of God. No prophecy is of any private interpretation. That means whoever, if, if anyone thinks that these words come from man, again, man had them, but the words are, are God inspired, that these, these are our word, the truth from God. That they're not, any interpretation means that, okay, the guy that's writing this down says that I think this is what really God meant here. And he writes that, no, that, that didn't happen. This is not for private interpretation. Those words went down the way that God intended them to be. By the way, some people use that verse as a, in a wrong way. They use it to say that, that God cannot speak to you the truth of his word. you got your idea of what it says. i got my idea of what it says. Yeah. So, so no, we interpret it. Yeah. That's yeah. not what it means. It's the people that wrote it. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the reason to do because people take a verse, just grab a verse, and if you look at that verse by itself, it, it could look like it means that, but you have to look at the context of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how many times have you seen that? I know you've seen it. We've all seen it. People look at a verse, and, and if you look at it that way, it's like, well, I think you're right, but it, it's so easy. Okay, conclusion. You don't have to write all this down. The scripture is our sole and final authority for all manner of faith and practice. And again, back to the, to the big, big uh, point that we're trying to make here. Not how we feel, not with what makes us happy, not what everyone else would do, not what we think Jesus would do. This is, this is our direction, this is our roadmap, this is our instruction manual, if you will. This is the truth. And write these verses down if you will, we're not going to them for, for time's sake. Proverbs 16.25 and Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. How we live our lives must be guided by Scripture. And then uh, Psalms, Psalms 1 is another one, too. Homework, read 2 Peter 2, all of 2 Peter 2, listing all the words that describe the following. Now, the biggest part of second, you know, false teachers themselves. References to false teachers. How the false teachers teach. The results in the lives of those who follow false teachers. And with that, that's the end of the uh, class today. I think uh, every thank you everybody for being here today. And with that being said, what was wrong with the coin? Was anything wrong with the coin? <laughs> two heads, two headed monster. Do you, do you think that was is, is a mistake of the net or? Is a counterfeit. Yeah. The stake of the net. I'm saying. I'm saying both sides of this here. Let me flip and see what that is. Who's calling heads? <laughs> it is. I had to look it up because th this is part of my things I inherited from my dad. I'm like a two-headed half dollar. Wow, that's got to be worth something. You know, that's a mistake of the men. It turns out it's a novelty item. This wasn't half and put back together. Yeah, somebody cut it apart. I mean, you look at the, even the little marks on the edge, they all line up. Well, who took the time to do that? Yeah. But it's a novelty item, so in, in a sense, it's counterfeit. You know? So if I went to the store and handed, you know, I made a purchase for 49 cents, you know, and handed somebody that, that half dollar, and you'd think they would look at both sides of that and say, I wouldn't. I'd just throw up the drawer, you know, and give them back a penny. So I don't know what would happen, when, you know, when the boss is doing the drawer at the end of the day, and you just took a counterfeit kind of half dollar. You always spend the cents, but, but anyway, I, I thought that I brought that up a couple of weeks ago. I remembered that. I should have brought it in at that point. I guess it's just a yeah, well, nowadays, somebody might look at those sides because we don't use a 50-cent piece anymore. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we do to some degree. They're still floating around there because somebody gave me two of them just the other day. <laughs> and I didn't look to see if it had two heads on it. <laughs> so again, thanks to everybody for being here today. I uh, hope you're getting something out of the first and second Peter. We still have two more weeks to go. Uh, we'll be finding out what the next series of classes will be uh, next quarter. So, Dan, would you close us in prayer today, please?